Christ, we are talking to our Creator of the heavens and the earth, God. It is preaching time in the house, Father God. I ask right now that you allow preacher and people to unite together in prayer and proclamation so that your word is declared, someone is empowered and encouraged, and someone comes to know you through the free pardons of their sins, God. Father God, we love you, we thank you, and we appreciate you, God, for everything you do and everything you are. It's in your son's mighty, matchless, marvelous, magnificent name you pray. Amen. 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 If you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to the Old Testament book of Genesis? Now, I'm going to show you how to find it. Take your Bible and open to the first page. Bam! There you are. There you are. Amen. I feel humor this morning. Amen. Genesis. Amen. Amen. Let, let the brother in. Amen. Genesis chapter 37, verses 2 to 11. Amen. Genesis chapter 37, verses 2 to 11. Amen. Don't forget about Brother Sam. Amen. Genesis chapter 37, verses 2 through 11. I will read for the New Living Translation. Those who are able to stand for the word of God, would you please stand with us? This is the account of Jacob and his family. When Joseph was 17 years old, he often tended his father's sheep. Amen. Can't get the okay, writing can get the next screen. And we need that screen. That screen for the screen. Go for a screen. He tended his father's flocks. Amen. He worked for his half brothers, the sons of his father's wives, Bilhah and Zilpah. Both Joseph, re but Joseph reported to his father some of the bad things his brothers were doing. Jacob loved, loved Joseph more than any of his other children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. So one day, Jacob had had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe. But his brothers hated Joseph because their father loved him more than the rest of them. They couldn't say a kind word to him. One night, Joseph had a dream, and when he told his brothers about it, they hated him more than ever. Listen to this dream, he said. We were out in the field, tying up bundles of grain. Suddenly, my bundle stood up, and your bundles all gathered around and bowed low before mine. His brothers responded, so you think that you will be our king, do you? Do you actually think you will reign over us? And they hated him all the more because of his dreams and the way he talked about them. So Joseph had another dream, and again he told his brothers about it. Listen, I have had another dream, he said. The sun, the moon, and eleven stars bowed low before me. This time he told a dream to his father as well as his brothers, but his father scolded him. What kind of dream is that, he said. He asked, will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow to the ground before you? But while his brothers were jealous of Joseph, his father wondered what the dreams meant. Thus far, the word of God, you may be seated in his presence. Amen. Amen. Rodney, give me a little bit on the mic. I think it's number four. Amen. It's a little bit on the mic. Amen. Thank you. Appreciate it. Right there. Amen. The title of our sermon today is Chasing Dreams, Part One. Chasing Dreams, Part One. You guys, I told you how nervous I was that God gave me a sermon that wasn't part of a sermon series. But God heard that prayer, and this week we're going to begin a new sermon series. And this sermon series, we're going to look at Joseph. We're going to follow Joseph as we go from the point of dream uh, revelation to dream realization. Amen. Someone here knows what it means to have received a dream from God. And by dream, I don't mean the dream where you're rich and you're married to Halle Berry or Denzel and you're sitting on the beach sipping my ties and this living. But I'm talking about a dream of purpose, a call, a vision where God calls you out of whatever you're doing and wants you to go to some place where you can serve him in a mighty, mighty way. Someone here ha has had a dream. If it wasn't for dreams, we 
wouldn't be who we are right now. Even Martin Luther King had a dream that one day all children, whether they're white or black, will be able to worship together, to walk together, to live together. Dreams are necessary. Dreams are part of the developmental process of any Christian. Every time we say God has called to do something, it more than likely started with a dream. And so God is going to take us through this sermon series talking about chasing dreams, chasing the vision, chasing the calling, fulfilling the calling. We're going to look at it from start to finish. And today, what God wants us to do is to look at Joseph's dreams. I mean, it's his dreams that get him in trouble. It's his dreams that cause him to be preyed upon by his brother, cause him to be sold into slavery, cause him to be sold to Potiphar, cause him to be accused of rape, cause him to be in prison, cause him to be forgotten about, cause him to be called into Pharaoh's chambers, cause him to be elevated to the second highest position in all of Egypt. It's his dreams. And many times we're so quick to get to the store with Potiphar and Potiphar's wife. We're too quick to get to the jail or the prison that we forget that it started with some dreams. Amen. And God said there's something we can learn about Joseph and his dreams. So today we're going to start this sermon series looking at his dreams. Joseph is a young man. In fact, Joseph is 17 years old. I don't see uh, Jaden here or, or Cameron, but they would, it was always almost 17, she's 15, she'd be 16, but about their age, the young man on the cusp of being an adult, he is in his father's house and one night, God gives him a dream. And in the dream, him and his brothers are, are, are harvesting Grain, amen. Grain grows on a stalk. You have to cut the stalk down. And back then they had what's called millstones. Today they have presses. They do the same thing. You cut the stalk down. You put the stalk into the uh, in the millstone. The millstone separates the grain from the shaft. All right. And so they are in the process of separating grain from shaft. And in in that dream, all of a sudden, Joseph's bundle of grain. He's got a bundle of grain, which means he's going to have a lot. That's a promise that you're going to have a lot. He, that bundle gets up, and that and, and, and all of a sudden, his brother's bundles fall and bow to him. And then he has a second dream. In the second dream, Joseph is somewhere. We don't know where he is, but all of a sudden, the sun, the moon, and 11 stars begin to orbit around him and to bow down to him. The revelation from the dream is that Joseph is going to become someone important uh, in his family. That Joseph was going to become a leader, that his family were going to look to him for leadership, for guidance, for, 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 their, for, for, for their vision of where they're going to go. That here it is, Joseph, this young boy who's just a boy, had a promised future. And the funny thing is God had just give him the dream, but God gave him a confirmation. In fact, I know people come up to me all the time and say, Pastor, listen to this. Tell me if you think God is calling me. And the first thing I say to them, I say, how many times have you heard God say this to you? And they're like, I've heard him say it to me three, four times. And I tell them all the time, the first time was a revelation. The second, third, and fourth time was a confirmation. You don't need to come talk to me about whether God has confirmed to you what he wants to do. If he keeps allowing you to see the same vision, the same dream, the same calling over and over and over again, then he's called you to that. I keep telling Dr. Rupert that she's going to come up here and preach. Stop asking me, Dr. Rupert, if you're called to preach. God has given you that vision and confirmed it, and you are going to be a preacher. Amen. She's going to be like, no, 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 that's not my vision. Amen. I just mess with She's my buddy. I got it. Amen. Amen. She, oh, let me move. Come here, Brother Deacon. Gary, I need to use you as a shield. Boy, she is throwing them daggers over here. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. Praise God. I'm teasing her. Uh, but many times we come to Pastor, listen to this. I think God wants me to do this. Pastor, listen to this. I think God wants me to apply for the job. I'm like, how do you know God wants you to apply for the job? I can't help. Every time I turn around, someone's called me supervisor. Someone's called me boss. They won't go to the boss's office. They come to my office and solve every problem. And I say, please go to the boss's office. But they're like, no, you have better solutions than the boss. That may be God 
confirm them for you. And so Joseph had a dream, one dream he had a second dream to confirm. And one thing we notice here is that when Joseph shares the details, the specifics about his dreams, his brothers get upset. His brothers get angry. His brothers feel slighted. They feel as like if Joseph has lost his everlasting mind. Now come on, y'all. I'm the oldest. I know I got some elder siblings in here. But y'all know what it's like. You're the oldest and your younger sibling comes and says, you know, I'm going to do this better than you. And the first thing we say, wait a second, hold on, little chum. Uh -uh, wait a second. I, 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 I'm your brother, not you. Hold on. There have been many times Terry, my younger brother, has found himself in headlocks and full Nelson just because he dared to open his mouth and tell me what he's going to do. I'm like, hold on, hold on, I'm a big brother. That goes to me first. There's, there's some kind of feeling for those who are oldest to hear your younger sibling tell you that they want to do better or do more or do greater than you. And it just gets you, it hurts you. It, we should be supportive of them, but the truth is we're not because we're the firstborns. We're the ones that everything should go through. We're the ones that God should see, that mama and daddy should call upon. We're the ones. But Joseph, this young boy, who's not even 18 years old yet, has a dream. And in his dream, his brothers are going to be bowing down to him. And so they're mad. They're upset. They're, they're, they're feeling some kind of way. And I want to posit to you today that, uh, in fact, let me back for a second. When I was reading this scripture, I was reading the notes that went along the scripture, and in the notes that went along the scripture, the people who prepared the Bible said Joseph was at fault for telling his brothers his dream. And he should have known better to tell his brothers that his brothers hated him because he had a dream. Okay. And and I was sitting there, I said, wait a second. That's not what scripture says. Scripture said his brothers hated him. They hated him more when he told them to dream. And so I said, wait a second, someone has got this wrong. And I looked at this and God said, here's the problem. Many of, of our uh, Bible uh, publishers, and I even heard ministers do this, we put the fault on Joseph as if Joseph is responsible for his, for his relationship with his brothers. We put it on Joseph. We say, Joseph was not Eve. Joseph's not Emmette. Let him to get in trouble. And I say, that is not only wrong, but it is dangerous. Because what we are saying is that when someone experiences a problem, the reason why they experience the problem is because of their own choices, because of their own fault. And don't get me wrong, there are sometimes we make some horrible choices. Amen. There are some times where, amen, we, we spend money, we associate ourselves with people, and they're the wrong choices. But many times we will find in our life that problems arise not because we've done anything wrong, but because we're trying to do everything right. In fact, the more you try to live a right life for God, the more you try to live righteously, to live faithfully, to live in accordance with God's law and God's love, you will find yourself in more trials and predicaments, more problems and, uh, and, and, and problems and, and tribulations. Let me tell you something. I ain't never going through this much trouble when I was out there doing whatever I wanted to do. Amen. 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 I don't even pray God. I would go out with my friends and hit it. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm like, no, I can't. I don't, I don't know what that, none of this is. I, wait, 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 I couldn't do any wrong when I was doing wrong. Come on, tell the truth somebody. She ain't done. But the answer that I said, I'm going to get right. All of a sudden, here come problems. I didn't know what Bill Clutch's words so I got right. But be for real. I, I didn't know what betrayal looks like until so I got right. I, I didn't know what, 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 what chaos and disorder was until I got right, until I made an intentional decision to live for God, to serve God. Then came the problem. And here what, what people say, we are in it because it had to be something you did. That's a very dangerous place to be. Because what we do, we absolve the persons that are causing problems in our life of responsibility. And then we say that the person who's going through, the reason why you're going through is because of you. Just put on your boots and pull up your bootstrap. What happens if I don't even have socks? <laughs> Come on, tell the truth. Joseph catches hell. Not because of anything he did. He's catching hell because everything is dead. I posit to you today. 
Joseph's life would not have been the way it was had Jacob not been a swindler and a trickster. Now I know at this point when we read Joseph and Jacob has calmed down, he's like, oh man, you know how you, how you, how you, how some of you folks were, you raise hell all the days you're young, like me, you're old, then you want to see me on the, on the stoop, with you little drink talking about, oh, I just don't know why these young people act like this. Come on, somebody. But the problem is, Jacob planted some seeds in his young life that did not harvest into his older life. And here's the thing. Let's look at Jacob's life for a second. Jacob cheated his brother out of his birthright. When Esau went after Jacob, Jacob fled. Jacob ran to his mother's brother, Laban, Rebecca's brother Laban, and found out that there's a bigger swindler and a cheater than him. That here he is, he had, he had two daughters. One was I, you know, that's like Terry's I, but I'm fine. He, I'm the fine brother. He's just the all right, brother. Amen. Amen. And so he had a, one sister that was good. Uh, then another one, boo, she is fine. And so Jacob, like most men, fell in love with the fine one. Laban had a problem on his hands. He realized if he didn't get rid of Leah, he'll never get rid of Leah. And so he swindles Jacob on Jacob's marriage night. Jacob gets drunk. Jacob's having a good time. He stumbles into his tent and he makes love to who he thinks is Rachel, only to wake up the next morning and realize it's Leah. And so, oh my God, what happened? He runs to Jacob and says, What did you do? I paid for Rachel. He's, and so this is Jacob. Jacob says something. Uh, Laban says, It's not right for the oldest, youngest daughter to get married before the oldest daughter. He said, So if you work another seven years for I'll give you my daughter. So in other words, he got 14 years. He got double for his trouble of messing with Jacob. And, and it's what happened. Jacob has to live, has to work for the 14 years. But at the time, he's swindling Laban. I know the story. Laban said, all right, you can only have the sheep that are spe uh, speckled. He didn't have any speckled sheep. So God made it so all of Laban's sheep were speckled. Uh, 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 livestock. Laban saw it, so wait a second, you can't have any more speckled livestock. Have, have, have the, 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 the white livestock. The, the ones are solid colors. And so God made it so all the livestock stopped making speckled livestock. Made. He was swindling Laban out of everything he had. And in the process, though, this is where the problem arises. Jacob loves Rachel, but he tolerates Leah. And the mess up thing is, Leah is in love with Jacob. And so what she does, she uses her ability to have kids as, a, as an attempt to get Jacob to love her. Come on, someone. Don't, don't I say, yeah, I, I'm crazy. You know what? I let him take me to dinner, and I let him take me to the movies, and then I let him come over and rub on my feet afterwards, and maybe he'll call me his girlfriend, and I have someone in my life. Come on, tell the truth. You know what I'm saying? If I invite the boss over, I know I really don't like the boss, but if I invite the boss over uh, for the family cookout, even though the boss is going to be the only one not related at the family cookout, the boss will see what kind of great person I am, so then the boss will say, if he's like that, and it's perfect personal life, maybe he'll be like that in his professional life, so here you are inviting someone that you know nothing about, and everyone at Femme Cookout is like, okay, what's up with the white brother over there? <laughs> Come on, tell the truth. Tell the truth. When we use what we have to get something, not because we are happy for the blessing of having it, but we see the blessing as a tool, as bait for this over here. And so Leah is popping out babies left and right to get Jacob to love her. But Jacob only loves Rachel. At some point, God says to Leah, you know what, honey, you are missing the point of why I'm allowing you to have babies. They're not for you to buy your husband's love. They're for you to love these babies as your babies, as treasures, gifts, gifts, and gifts, and to be their mom. So he calls down Leah's womb. Leah is still so determined to get Jacob's love. He gives her Bilhah, her servant, and makes her a concubine. And so what happens, not only has Leah produced children, not because she wanted them, but because she wanted Jacob, she has produced children that are, that, that are neglected because daddy's not around, and daddy really doesn't want them. Mama doesn't see them for who they are, but now she has brought another person into the picture for her to be used as a tool and her kids to be treated the same way the kids she had with Jacob. 
on now. And on the other side, this uh, other side, this question here is Rachel. Rachel is in love with Jacob, but Rachel doesn't feel like her. Uh, 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 uh. What's the Rachel say? You make me feel like a woman. Y'all know the song. Y'all know the song. Amen. And, and it does sound good, but you know what she's saying. You have made me, you, you have enabled me to be a woman. Here's Rachel saying, I am a woman that cannot produce children. I, my value is in producing children. I know this is going to make some of you upset. You got to understand it's not the time we live in. This is a different time. And that time, a woman's status came from the kids she had, especially if she had boys. The more boys she had, the more the higher her status was. And she couldn't even produce a girl. So guess what she does? She takes Zilpah and puts Zilpah in Jacob's bed, hoping that, Jake, that she and Jacob would get a child. Well, the child are born because of mine. Now, Jacob doesn't want to love this child because it ain't racially his child. And Jacob's like, if they ain't got both our DNA on it, I don't want it. And so what happens, you have 10 sons that are born to a father that really doesn't want them and mothers who don't appreciate them. They hate, they, they hate their father. They, they may despise their mothers, but they hate their father because their father has brought them into a world, has not equipped them, has not prepared them, has not loved them, has not trained them, has not spent any time with them. But here it is. Here comes Joseph. And I know the word says, Jacob loved Joseph because he had Adam in his old age. That's not true. Jacob didn't have him as a young boy. He grew up. Jacob loved Joseph because he's Rachel's child. That's the object of his affection. That's the object of his desire. That's where he wants to be. That's the family structure that he has always, always wanted. That's why he loves this son because he feels this son is his son. Not the mother child. So imagine you grew up in a house where daddy didn't want you, didn't want a couple of your siblings, but that one little nappy headed, rusty, dusty in the corner over there, daddy could not stop being excited about talking about buying something for, making them feel special. And here it is, you've been begging all your life. Daddy, come outside and catch a ball with me. Daddy, come outside and shoot with me. Daddy, come outside and let's play soccer. Daddy, come outside and let's wrestle. His brothers hated him not because of him. They hated him because of their daddy. The problem is they just couldn't tell their daddy that they hated him. How many of y'all have parents that you wish you could say, I wish you could hit by a Mack truck, but you were scared to say it out loud? <laughs> Come on now, I can't be the only one. I'm going to talk about it. <laughs> I wish you could hit by a Mack truck. Ooh, ooh, I don't like you anymore. Ooh, I'm leaving. I can't be the only one up in my room talking about I'm leaving. Come on now. Some of us have parents, let's be, uh, hey, hey, let me say this. Some of us have parents that if these child abuse laws have been in, in, in around when they, when we were kids, some of our parents would be doing triple life sentences right now. <laughs> let's be for real. You weren't happy when you got that tail, well, you were upset. But you, you dare not, your mama being at home and say, what you say? No, I didn't. I didn't say no, mama. In your mind, you thinking it. They wanted to cuss their father out, but they knew they couldn't. They knew they, their father was crazy. If their father was going to swindle his brother out of his birthright, what in the world would he do to them? And so they held it. And so what they couldn't say to Joseph, I mean to Jacob, they said to Joseph. And so here's the thing. Jacob could have gotten up and said, God said that I am going to play football. They would have hit God said, well, it didn't matter what he said. They were going to hate whatever he did. And that brings us, in this part of Chasing Dreams, there's some warnings that God wants to give us in Chasing Dreams. Ronnie, give me the first, first point. Amen. Let me read this. It's kind of long. I couldn't figure out how to shorten it, so I just left it like it is. It's not the fact that we receive vision, i.e. call, purpose from the Lord that meets our enemies and adversaries, hate and despise us as they do. Rather, it's a fact that our enemies and adversaries think that our Heavenly Father holds us in higher esteem. It shows us better favor than he does for them. It causes them to hate and despise us. It's not that God chose you. Because he chose us all. Every last one of you is chosen in here. People hate you not because he showed you. 
They hate you because they think he's giving you more attention than them. Amen. My mother tells this joke all the time. Um, I was in uh, daycare, uh, after school care, one or two. And as usual, I'm cutting up and acting a fool. And the teacher had nothing but a negative report to give me my mother. So as we walked through the car, my mom said, if I ever hit you, then I'm going to wear your tail. I'm not even going to wait. I'm going to wear you out right here in the middle of the day. Da, 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 da. And so she's going, you know how moms go good. Mamas just can't say it and leave it alone. And every time they think about it, and I'm not a man. Let me tell you something like this. So we're in the car, and she's going on and on and on. And so mom says, she does this little hand touch her on her elbow from the back seat. Mom said, what do you want? Her brother's like, me too, mama. Me too, Spade. Me too, mom. <laughs> And did not want to miss out on it. So whatever it was I was getting, it had to be worth him getting it to. <laughs> Come on, y'all. Let's be for real. That's how many of us act toward one another. God comes and blesses us. God comes and shows us favor. God comes and anoints us in some way. And instead of congratulating those persons for what God has done, we get upset. What is it about him or her that made God choose him or her over me? I can sing too. I come to church too. I can read the scriptures too. I participate in ministry too. Why is it, in fact, you know one of the things the enemy does to try to keep us from working together is make us jealous of one another. Make us envious of one another. I can't tell you how many times I get the news about people's churches, what they're doing. And I say to myself, I have you to ask, to ask God, I say, God, why is it that I'm getting this news? I mean, I don't belong to these churches. I'm not members of these churches. And then I realized what it was. That was an enemy trying to make me upset because we aren't doing what our neighbors are doing. Amen. And one of the things God said to me, he said, don't you ever be jealous of your neighbor because not everything that your neighbor does comes from me. There are folks who are pretending to be sold out for Christ, who are not sold out for Christ, who are letting the enemy do things for them, and they're here, they're bragging and boasting, we're upset about it. Amen. Let me give you the world life equivalent of that. You over there upset because the Joneses got two Mercedes, two BMWs, and two Audis, and here you are still in your Ford Temple. Come on, somebody. <laughs> you don't know they can't sleep at night because they're over there hustling and scheming. They're selling drugs, they're fixing uh, stolen goods. They can't sleep at night. And every time a go car backfires, they're down the road. Come on, get the door, get the door, get the door. But you're so upset because God has blessed them. It's like better than He's blessed you. Not realizing who you are, you got everything honestly. Not only did you get it honestly, everything's paid off. That you don't owe a soul. Now here's the thing, you sitting on money that you can spend, discret you got discretionary funds. Come on, someone. I know we, but let me use a term that we don't usually use. We got discretionary funds. These are funds that after we pay everything, we can do what we want to do with them. And but you're upset because you don't have the outward manifestations that someone else has. And that's why people are hating on you. Because they look at you. They look at you. They think everything is on the up and up. I tell people all the time, stop complaining because someone's looking at your life saying, man, I want that life. Mm -hmm. You see, we over here complaining because guess what? The roof, hole has, the, the roof has a small hole where you have to put one pot over here until we get to fix it. But until you've been in a country where you have no roof, or if you have a roof, you have no window. If, or if you have windows, you have no doors. That in, in your side, in the, the floor of your house, is not carpet, it ain't Burberry. You know, it 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 ain't it 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 ain't it ain't a a a towel, ceramic towel, or, or bamboo floor. Until you got red clay as your floor, you don't know how good you have it. I was telling my wife, we were going to a destination wedding. One of her girlfriends was going. We, we were going there. She was in the wedding, uh, and we we're in the Dominican Republic. And we stopped the school bus in front of our van. And it's amazing that the, the, to get to these resorts, you have to go through the worst part of towns. And the school bus stopped, and I looked over, and the house was as close as I am to that second row. And I could see in the house, no air conditioning, no floor, no windows, no doors, no screens. And the mama and daddy were sitting there barefooted uh, in, in the doorway for the children. And these were the conditions that these kids lived in. And let me tell you, if you never mentioned the Dominican, it's 120 degrees in the shade. 
and hear you upset because it takes 20 minutes for the air conditioning to kick in and work at your house. You, you, you upset because Purdue didn't come over and fry the chicken for you. You got to fry the chicken yourself. Pete, you, you don't know what you look like to other people. And when other people see you, they see blessing and anointing. Yeah, I'm going to to my eyeballs. You got that. Some people can't even, you know, how you, you know how you got that? Because you use credit wrong. I shared this at the Leadership Development Seminar yesterday. Uh, now that y'all know me, we'll be coming up on the year, y'all. Y'all know me, we can really get down to business. So let this year coming up, we're going to talk about debt. That ugly D word. And we're going to talk about the ways we can get out of debt. Because guess what? Anyone who lives in debt is enslaved to their debt whore. And you can't, uh, you can't accomplish justice if the one you're trying to get justice from, you owe them money. Because here's the thing, have y'all ever heard of this thing called an acceleration clause? Don't you say a thing, because I know you know what acceleration clause is. They may not know. The acceleration clause is for any reason. If the lender believes that you're not going to pay the debt, can make the total debt due immediately. Who's got the money saved up to pay off all these debts at one time? But yeah, guess what? Old Navy's got that super cash day, and I bet most of us are running by Old Navy's as soon as we get out here, we're going to spend our super cash at Old Navy. <laughs> Not realize we've got to spend double to use the super cash. Okay? We are where we are because God has put us there. Persons are hating on us because of God. Joseph wasn't where he was because of him. He was where he was because of Jacob. His brothers were hating on him because of Jacob. That brings me to my second point. Give me my second point, Rodney. Amen. It's our responsibility using the servant that the Lord has given us to recognize who those persons are that hate and despise us as he begins the process of realizing his will for our lives. God has given you the servant. May not give you the ability to sing. Amen. I can testify to that. Amen. He may not give you the ability to do many things, but one thing he does give you is discernment. And you know what the fault of many Christians is? We don't use it. Let me tell you how I know you don't use it. Amen. Amen. I'm in there too. So when you come to me and you say, I would have never thought that this person did that to me. And then when you start saying, okay, give me the history of this verse. Give me your experience. You start listening to it. And they're, they're telling you instances where the person that showed they're not reliable, they're not trustworthy, they're not to be extended credit, and you extended it anyway. You didn't use the sermon, baby. God gave it to you for a reason. Let me tell you something. It didn't, I know this is going to be new to you. You think everyone loves you and everyone just wants Not everyone around you is around you for the right reasons. Amen. You know that, right? Now I'm around you because I love you. I don't want you looking at me saying, Pastor, I'm going all the wrong way. I'm around you. When I call you, you can not come to church because you ain't come to church. Not because I'm looking for something. I'm more concerned about you. But there are people that are around you, that are around you, because if they can't get the cup blessing, they're willing to eat off of your salsa. Try this. If you don't, if you don't believe me, stop doing whatever you do for a week and see who called you. If you're the one where everyone comes over to the house and eat after work every day, or you're the one where everyone comes to, to have the happy hours at, at your place after work, stop for a week and see what happens. Okay. See if anyone says, you know what, sister God, you, you've done it so much, why don't you come over to my house? We'll go over to my house and do it. That's how you know what, what person's intense and your hearts are. If you can stop doing what you're doing, stop providing, and they're still around. That's why mamas are right. Mama, there's no one that's going to love you like a mama because there's really nothing you can do for mama other than to be her child. But mama puts up with your rusty, dusty self. Mama picks you up, dusts you off, kisses you on the forehead, tells you you're going to be all right. When the boy broke your heart, mama was there saying, you, you are, he wasn't worth you anyway. When the little girl wouldn't call you back, mama said she was a tramp, and her mama was a tramp, and her grandma was a tramp. Don't you be upset about who's a no tramp. Your real woman's going to come. A mama loves you. Find someone that loves you like mom. Guess what? I, uh, I, uh, one of my colleagues, that was Dr. Salah, Dr. Salah said to me one day, 
So he's going to make it so these girls can't get married. I said, praise God, amen. <laughs> he said, why you say that? I, I said, because no one should be able to treat them better. I'm the standard. They should do a good approximation. But they should always know that, guess what? My, the way my daddy loves is the way a man is supposed to love me. So if they don't love me the way my dad, I don't need them. And I said to him, I said, ain't that what you did with your three daughters? He kind of cheats. That one bitch, he's like, oh, you got me. Here's the truth. The mothers with your sons. She, she should surpass you. And I know some of the ladies going to be upset with me. But he cook, she cook for him all the time. She helped him. Oh, guess what? That's the standard she said. She said, don't you want that for your son? Don't you want someone to love your son? Amen. Come on, mama. Amen. Come on, mama. Amen. 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 Look at mama. Mama, mama won't let you even come to church by yourself. And she's so afraid that the wrong one will look at you. Discernment. Jacob didn't use it. Jacob was so, you know what the problem is? I think Jacob was so happy about what God was doing, he did not pay attention. I think Jacob really believed what we believe. We believe that those who are related to us really have our best interests. They have our backs. They want to be here for us. They got, they got us no matter what. I think Jacob was, it felt that way. I don't think Jacob believed that he had to worry about his brothers. Well, the truth is, the ones who treated him the worst were his brothers. Because watch what happens in this his story. Everywhere he goes, he finds favor with everyone he runs into, except his brothers. What is God saying to you? Stop looking across the street from the one who's going to hurt you. You better look at your house. You better look at the ones who call themselves cousins, nephews, nieces, brothers, sisters, uncle, and uncle. Not everyone on the team is so all supposed to be on the team. Here's another thing Joseph did. One, he didn't recognize who his enemies were. He didn't realize that he just couldn't say anything to everyone. Can I say this plainly the way God wants me to say it? Um, Candace not here. She usually she gives me permission to be real. So y'all pretend y'all can't just say, be real, Pastor. I'm just gonna say it to me. Be real, be real. Amen. Amen. Y'all need to shut up. And my wife, my, my she's like, Daddy, yeah, yeah, that's a bad word. So now you just gonna say it. Y'all need to shut up. Too many of y'all talk too much. God comes to you and says, I'm about to bless you. I'm about to expand your boundaries. I'm about to do this. I'm about to do that. And the first thing you're gonna run to, guess what? God said, He's about to expand my boundaries. Everyone looking around like, oh, this is our chance. Not everything that God shares with you is meant for everyone else. Not everything God reveals to you is meant for someone else to see. A lot of things are meant just for you because God wants to do something in you before he can do something in someone else. Amen. And many times God hasn't even brought you to the realization of what he wants to do, but we're too busy sharing with what's going on. I would never get this. I had this case. And I couldn't believe how easy this case was. I said, I said the prosecutor had to be missing this one. And, when I, and, 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 so, and so what happened, when we went to court, I said, you really don't want to go to court, this case, you know? So he told the prosecutor, said, why? In my assignment, I said, because that's why I see. The prosecutor continued the case. When we came back and that's how he had short up the holes. Those holes weren't in the case anymore. Those pieces of evidence that were missing that I ran off of my mouth with, he went and found every one piece of those evidence. And I, in the interim, I got evidence. I was like, oh, I had to open my mouth. Why did I close my mouth? You cost yourself something when you talk, when you share with everyone what your plans are. Learn to be quiet. Learn to keep it yourself. And even if God is giving you something to share with someone, it may not be time to share it with them yet. Y'all do know that in the discernment when y'all talking to me, I can see some things that happen in your lives, and I just pretend like I don't know. Because God said, ain't time for you to say it yet. You walk up to me, you hug me, it's almost like a sci-fi movie. As soon as you touch my boots, Lord, they did on that. And you know, you went and pastor and say, hey, you need to come to my office so we can talk to you. God said, no, 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 Y'all got to get to the point where y'all can hold it. So I'm saying we can hold it. I'm sorry, we can hold it. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Like we're working on Ryan right now. Ryan is not the one you want to take with you by for some birthday gifts. Ryan has come home and told me every birthday and Christmas gift. My wife has gotten me such a time she can walk and talk. And we try to tell her, Ryan, stop, don't tell. But they want to know, Daddy. They want to know, Mama. 
And so what I, what I figure I can take Brian on the decoy. So she's telling, but not what you want to do. If you got to tell, go on a decoy, huh? If you can't use this question to be quiet, go on a detail, huh? Jacob didn't realize who was around. So here's the thing, he was already, he already had his brothers upset because he's been telling them. Daddy they ain't out there in the field telling no sheep. Daddy they ain't got the sheep doing anything. Daddy they out here. He ain't got enough, enough discretion to realize that he the ones he told on the ones that he's coming to talk to. So they're looking for a chance to kill. Give me the last point, then we're gonna go home. Amen. Amen. While elevation does breed contempt, it's imperative that the Christian remains humble within the presence of the Lord. While elevation does breed contempt, it's imperative that we remain humble within the presence of the Lord. You know what Joseph should have done after receiving that dream? He should have kept it to himself and prayed to God for further revelation. One of the things we do, one of the mistakes we make is God gives us something and we don't seek further revelation from God and we get out here and start doing something we don't know the plan. We don't know how God's going to do it. We don't know when God's going to do it. Let me give you an example of that. God appears and Abraham said that you and your wife are going to have a child. Guess what Abraham does that night? He's there. She walks in. And she look at him like, boy, you don't put your clothes on. I got to wash clothes and, and, and do this. Your mama coming by later on this week. I got to get this house clean. All he knows is he's having a baby. You know how he knows how to have a baby. Amen. Amen. Oh, that's us. Technology. There it goes. There it goes. Amen. It's us. It's us, okay. My bad. That is us. Uh oh. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Hold on a second. The devil is a liar. All right, here you go. There it is. Amen. Praise God. Whoo! Technology. <laughs> you know, that's what we're going to put some big speakers outside, amplify it. So if you, if you don't hear it when you drive by, you don't get it at all. You know what I'm saying? Amen. Amen. Where was I, y'all? Got me all this. <laughs> uh, amen, amen, amen. He should have done nothing except pray for God for revelation of how this thing's going to come to pass. He should have been humble. He should have served more. He should have made himself more available to God. In fact, let me, give, let me contrast Joseph with Jesus. God made Jesus aware of a whole lot of things, but you don't see Jesus popping off in the mouth talking about you. I'm going to beat you, Satan. You're going down tomorrow, Satan. I'm going to drop these bombs on you, Satan. That Jesus got busy doing his work. That every time someone came to them and came, I came to him and came to him saying, Master, he turned around and said, No, I'm your servant. What is it that you want me to do? How is it you want me to bless you? Where do you want me to go? Who do you want me to touch? Who do you want me to pray for? Who do you want me to perform a miracle on? That it didn't matter the more God, and God kept elevating him and elevating him. And ele you know what the ultimate elevation for Jesus was? It was to be God's Messiah. He was already God's son. But God called Jesus and said, Jesus, come on, I need you to do something for me. I need you to be my Messiah. And instead of popping his collars, popping his chains, getting all big-headed, you know how some of us get, yeah, I'm a new CEO here, y'all gonna bow down to me, this is how things gonna be, this is what that is. Jesus came down and took the form of humanity. He took the form of sin. He took the form of fault. He took the form of evildoing and wrongdoing, of jealousy, of backbiting, of lying and betrayal. He took the form and he began to serve. He began to wash feet and not only wash feet, but wash spirits. He ended up beginning casting spirits out. He ended up giving people life and life more abundantly. He ended up leading people into, the, into a promised land that they had never believed believe before. He gave them water that they never thirst again. He gave them food that they were never hunger again. God came down and became more and more humble. If you want to look up humility, there better be a picture of Jesus right beside the word because there's no one that was as humble as Jesus was. What is God saying to you right now? Yes, you are about to be elevated. Yes, you are about to be increased. Yes, God is about to expand your territory. Yes, God is going to make you the head and not the tail. Yes, Yes, God will make you a lender and not a borrower. Yes, God is going to do some awesome works in you. But as God does a work in you, you ought to become more and more like a servant, a lowly servant. You ought to become more humble. You ought to become more trustworthy. You ought to become more and more uh, seeking to help others. You ought to become more of what God requires of you the higher you get. He 
takes you. You should be sitting here talking about I'm the man, I'm the woman, I'm the boss, I'm the HNIC in charge, amen. You should be able to say I'm the janitor, I'm the custodian, I'm the low man on the totem pole. It should surprise people that when they get to know you that you really are the low man on the totem pole, that you're actually at the top, that you don't think being at the top is something worthy being bragged about. You ought to show them what it means to be a servant. I was here one night, and I'm done. And it was late, too. And one of our members drove by. So I happened to call me to tell me that the gate was open. And so I'm like, the gate open. So I was in there. So I didn't tell me. I said, did you ever hit you that maybe I'm here at the church working? <laughs> like, Pastor, it is not three at night. You're still here at the church working? Someone has to do it. There's a job. Someone has to do it. I wish other people would be here with me so we can all go home at a better time, but someone has to do it. And they're like, I can't believe it. The pastors I know, you can't catch them at 4.30. I said, yeah. I said, oh, what am I doing? I said, what am I doing? All the other pastors out at 4.30. Yeah. And then again, I realize every pastor that this person talked about had a staff of 20 or 30 employees. It's easy to do what other people do when you have what they have. But here's the thing. God called me to serve you all. To serve you. Okay? That means if I got to be your waiter, I got to be your waiter. If I got to be your chef, I got to be your chef. If I got to be the one to bust your table, I got to be the one to bust your table. Now, I would like some help back there in the kitchen. Let me say that. Hint, hint, hint. I'd like some help in the kitchen. But guess what? If my job is to make sure y'all y'all are fed, I'm going to make sure you're fed. And I'm going to do whatever it is I need to do to make sure you're fed. And I do not think or feel that it is beneath me to do what I need to do to make sure you're fed. Because I realize in serving you, I'm not just serving you. I'm serving God. I say that to encourage you that the pastor can find the time and the commitment to serve you. You can do the same thing in serving the people that God placed under you. They may not call you pastor, they call you brother. They may not call you preacher, they call you boss. They may not call you rev, they call you community leader such and such. You should be able to do like Jesus, to become more humble, the more people begin to elevate you, and God elevates you into the places he wants you to be. Amen? Amen. 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 Praise God. Amen.